to Something for the Turbo, the new weekly podcast brought to you by Unfound, the global platform for the travel-loving cyclist. Today, I'm joined by David Lloyd. David is the co-founder of Velo Vietnam, and we enjoyed a fascinating discussion around just the incredible array of cycling on offer in Vietnam, the different areas you can cycle, the accommodation you can expect, food, the culture, and so much more. It was a really fascinating discussion. David also talked us through the frontier events that he's launched, and they sound just fantastic, something that I recommend everyone checks out. Anyway, without further ado, enjoy the conversation. If you're enjoying the podcast, please do subscribe and do spread the word as well. We'd love it if you can tell as many of your cycling friends as possible. But for now, let me introduce David. Enjoy the conversation. David, thank you very much for joining me. How are you? Great, thank you. Thanks for having me. Very good. Well, it'll be good to have a a little delve into the world of cycling within Vietnam. It's certainly not a place that naturally springs to mind for for a cycling trip, but quite a diverse array of cycling on offer. How how on earth did you end up with a cycling business in Vietnam? What brought you to Vietnam in the first place? The reason we came here back back in the day was actually my wife. So she's a primary school teacher by trade and back in London, she was working in in a London primary school. And one summer she decided to take her six weeks and abandon me in London and go traveling. And so she went around Laos, Cambodia, Vietnam and fell in love with Vietnam. And then we got married in uh, 2010 and we'd always planned to go live abroad somewhere. And uh, so we were looking at where we could go and, and live and potentially work. And it was her choice to give Vietnam a go. So we, originally we planned for around six months here and I would work in uh, freelance I was uh, doing travel journalism and she would volunteer and we just fell in love with the place. And so, so as I say, that was 2010 and we've been here ever since. Oh, wow. So it's been uh, a decade now. Yeah. And, and in terms of like the link from how we moved from coming out here to starting a, a road travel, a cycling business, as I say, at the time, I was doing a lot of travel journalism and uh, I was working freelance for most of these newspapers and magazines, uh, but then got uh, a job with Footprint, the British travel guides. So I was going around Vietnam and Laos and uh, generally I'd have a driver but I'd just give the drive my bag and then I would cycle my bike. So I got to know a lot of the, the roads in both Vietnam and Laos and just found it was just the most amazing place to both the most amazing places to, to cycle. I had it in my mind for a long time. I'd love to set up a cycling tour company and share that with people. Okay, But I really, I wanted to do it with somebody uh, to have a partner. So it took uh, a while and eventually I was uh, introduced to Ashley, who's my, my business partner in Belo, Vietnam. And so I met him for the first time in a bus station in Hanoi and we went off to a three-day cycling trip in uh, Hazang in the far north. And uh, of course, I had no idea at the start of that, that potentially we'd become business partners. But we got onto that night bus and uh, got onto the back of the bus. I remember getting on and it was maybe 10 p.m. at night. And I really didn't want to talk to anybody. I just wanted to get my head down and sleep. And I looked over at Ash, who was a couple of seats ahead of me. And he was deep in Vietnamese conversation with his travel partner next to him and I just thought that's perhaps the kind of guy that would be uh, would be good to go into business with I just had that a good feeling about it straight away that he just got straight stuck into a to a Vietnamese conversation with somebody at that time and yeah so I had a good feeling straight away and in the end uh, yeah we we started Velo Vietnam together oh right so it's just a chance meeting that you guys were getting the, the coach up there the bus up there no, well it was a friend of mine Matt who lived in Hanoi and uh, so he he'd been buddies with Ash back in Canberra for for years and they'd cycled together mountain bike road bike all sorts of uh, cycling and then uh, yeah. so ash had never ridden in the north and got in touch with matt who uh, who knew i knew those roads well so ash was down in central vietnam at the time and discovering a lot of the roads around the hoi an Nang area and i discovered a lot of the stuff up north so i took him almost kind of guided him around that for those three days actually we had one other guy with us aaron who's from uh, hong kong so a lot of the people you know or maybe you know him as well aaron ackerson a swedish yes, cyclist yeah, yeah. from project 852 he was on that trip as well with us so that was probably 2014 or so. so. And that's where you hatched the plan to, to set up Velo Vietnam? Yeah, well, I'd been hatching it for a while in my mind and it was, I don't think I actually mentioned it to Ash on that trip. It was sort of afterwards we had, I, I thought perhaps he's the right person and we, we got into uh, a bit more of a discussion about it later on. I can't actually really remember how it, how it all happened, but somehow after that we became, uh, yeah, Velo Vietnam partners. And prior to getting to, to Vietnam, were you a cyclist by background? Is that your... Uh, back in, uh, in the so UK I'm from or? Norfolk, so yeah, the opposite of... Uh, uh, somewhere I mean I love the mountains and cycling in the mountains or running yeah. in the mountains but from Norfolk so I used to spend a lot of my time in uh, North Wales and it was oh, a mix of, yeah. so Snowdonia 
and uh, just outside Snowdonia. So it would be uh, sort of mountain biking there and a lot of whitewater kayaking and fell running. And so it was a more, I was a much more balanced individual at that point in terms of sport. But when I came out to Vietnam, it completely shifted. There was no mountain running scene here at all at that time. There is a huge scene now, okay. but then yeah. there was nothing. And it was about really discovering Vietnam and getting out on the bike and seeing the country and travel and the best way to do that was the was was the road bike so i really became much more focused as a as a cyclist when i came out here but yeah back in the as i say north uh, wales would be and then also when i lived in london i'd cycle out like do classic kind of like laps around regent's park kind of cycling and ride out to brighton and south downs etc but uh so yeah and then yeah at school i always rode bikes to school and back so cycling's always been there but as a real passion it's been the last last 10 years very good so vela vietnam's been going five years now talk us through the kind of trips that you do it's quite diverse and it's evolving all the time but are they bespoke trips do you do sort of general tours how, how does it all work yeah they're all bespoke and we we generally do uh group tours although we, we've had a couple of of individuals so we had uh, for example we had one individual we took on our vietnam lao vietnam gravel epic over new year so one person uh, with ash we've had a couple of couples come as well and then we also have our big group training ride so it'll be uh, bike teams from the region generally that want to come in and smash themselves for four or five days on on big days and then we also have some small groups which are much more sort of pedestrian pace they're here to still knock out 100k maybe 150k a day but they're not after sort of segment hunting or going particularly quickly but they're you know, more into just enjoying the cycling and the, and the food and, and the scenery so i frankly enjoy everything there's so much an offer in in vietnam I've, I've done a bit of traveling there and i'm still sort of discovering it but how would it work would a group come to you or india come to you and say okay this is what we're thinking and you would tailor it accordingly or would they say okay we're thinking about going up to the north and then you can sort of work around that how does it normally sort of pan out in terms of planning a tour and how would you decide what part of vietnam or what riding to do for, for each individual group uh, normally if when we get an inquiry we'll try and have a chat over skype or whatsapp with the with the person so we can uh, get a good idea about what they're looking for and in that chat we can talk about yeah what time of year and what time of year will affect where they go and then we can have a chat about how much climbing they want what sort of how much how many k's a day and then Generally, after that chat, then I'll put together or Ash will put together some options and then we'll send okay. them across and then probably have another quick chat and then we we create something for them. So it's all all bespoke. We don't have any set departure tours where you can join a group with, with other riders at the moment. That might be something we do in future, but for, for now it's uh, all bespoke. Which is great. So it's, it's totally built around the individual group, which is quite exciting. You mentioned time yeah, of year there. I was going to say, it's one, another good thing about that is that not only do they get what they want, that we, we know that the people who are going to, well, we're 99% sure that when people come, they're going to be happy with it. So, you know, it yeah. removes that yeah. kind of risk factor of uh, sort of mis-selling yeah. somebody something, essentially. But uh, yeah, time of year. Is it all year? Can you go all year round? Yeah, absolutely. You can go all year round. Um, the best time in here in Central, so I'm now talking to you from Hoi An in Central Vietnam, and yeah. uh, here is fantastic. If actually, this season has been a bit strange. So all the way from October was beautiful right the way through to now. It's been fantastic. Wow. Uh, now the weather starts to get a bit warmer. But okay. uh, if you want to do, if you you know, we can get go inland and get some altitude from here. And so even though it's hot, it's we, we just do early starts and try and stay a bit higher. And then it's uh, still okay. pleasant to ride. And then we can do a lot of rides where we go along the coast as well. So then you've got the sea air and you can always you know, jump in the ocean at a lot of the points along the rides as well. So so down here is good, uh, as I say, like right the way that's, through actually, that's October. A, October to what now is sort of May time. Well, so now and then we still have groups come in sort of notably around. So there's Ironman here in May normally. And we've had right, groups okay. come from come for Ironman and then do a tour after that. And right up until until June, and then people can still come. We'll still do things July if people in this part of the world, if people were happy to ride in fairly hot temperatures. And then up north in the in really high mountains, up there you can ride like fantastic March, April through to now is fantastic. And then later on, September, October, November, December is beautiful as well, and particularly September for the harvest. So you've got the golden. Okay, so they're the two sweet spots. Yeah, but yeah, any time we've got their place. So let's start with where you are now and delve into that a little deeper. I mean, for those that haven't been to Hoi An, it is one of the most incredible little towns anywhere I've been in the world really. Tell us a little bit about the town and and how you would run a tour there and and what's on offer from a cycling perspective but also off the bike as well because it's one of my favorite places I've ever been to. We like to 
yeah, I mean, I totally agree with you. It's just yeah, so we, that's why we we just moved here a, a year ago with my family. I've got so two kids, and it's a fantastic place for for family holidays. So it's one one option you can do here as well is bring bring family. And we can try and mix in things off the bike for for the for the kids and whichever partner doesn't want to ride. So family options are, are, are big in Hoi An. And otherwise, yeah, the riding here we normally start and finish tours here because as you say, so it's a magic little place. So you and you've got fantastic food options great little coffee shops more and more fantastic coffee shops actually yeah. so the riding in the immediate area around the town is is quite flat and easy so it's also good for just a little warm-up acclimatization ride but then we'll normally head in to towards laos so this this part of vietnam is very thin you can ride in a day and you'll be right, up in okay. the mountain looking over the border into into laos and you've got wow. a lot of very remote jungle climbs out there so you'll be you can ride through say like 30 or 40 kilometers without really seeing a shop and barely seeing a car or even another motorbike and have some 9k 10k climbs and then we can stay in up in the mountains there you can stay in very very basic like in a remote ethnic minority village homestays and then uh, you can come back down huge descents back to towards the coast and then the closer you get to the coast the more kind of upmarket accommodation you you can have so what we tend to do for groups who want it is take them and show them the more sort of authentic and sort of real Vietnam up at high in the mountains and then bring them back down to the the coast for a bit of more of a luxurious stay and, and then you've got the the coastal roads to bring you back over into Hoi An which is the kind of the most famous okay not famous outside Vietnam but famous within within the country in the area is the, the Hai Van Pass which is a 9k 5% but either side of the pass you and fantastic pavement on the way, particularly on the way down, as you come back down into uh, Da Nang, and then in Da Nang City, which is just uh, 25k up the road from here, we've got a peninsula called Sun Cha, which is home to endangered uh, red shank Dirk Langer, the most amazing primates. And if you go out early and take on some of the ridiculously steep climbs at the back end of that peninsula, then uh, you've got quite a good chance of seeing those, and get you get the views back across the two bays of Da Nang City. So there's a yeah. huge uh, variety you can do a in huge array in, of in stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And where do people if people are coming from Europe or the US or, or elsewhere, can you fly directly to Da Nang or how, how, how would you get to Hoi An? Uh, the majority of our customers are from the region. So Singapore, Hong Kong, Thailand, and they just fly straight into Da Nang. And then we have had, we've quite had people come in from the US, different parts of Europe, UK, of course, and most of those have done the northern tours actually so they just fly straight into Hanoi and go straight out from there right okay if you ride if you fly into here one of the great things about the cycling out of the central Vietnam region is for let's say Singapore or Hong Kong guys they come in on the morning flight and then we'll be out on a ride straight from the city straight onto that peninsula in time for lunch or do an afternoon ride there so that's one of the big benefits of doing a a central Vietnam ride is just so so easy so you can you don't have to waste yeah. a day or lose a day on on transfers faffing around yeah that's that's amazing and for those that don't know Hoi An it's a UNESCO World Heritage Town isn't it or site and tell us a bit about the town itself because it's for those that don't know it's it's a wonderful place to go and visit yeah so it's an ancient trading town and the, the central part of the town is this classic yellow or oh, it's all yellow painted throughout and it really is kind of like picture postcard beautiful. Maybe if you think about somewhere like Venice, Dubrovnik, then you would slot it in along, alongside those. Uh, it does get quite busy now with tourism. But if you go out early, like cyclists tend to do, then we can roll through the town and you get a feeling of it like it was back in the day before people had discovered it. Um, yeah. So we'll tend to ride through there dead early and then pick, like shoot through some of the markets, enjoy some local street food and then uh, get out, out of the town once people are, get up at a normal time of day. <laughs> To, to come in and enjoy it yeah it's, it's, it's absolutely yeah. stunning and people are super friendly here very very cyclist friendly town as well and yeah amazing amazing food culture the food is amazing in vietnam and, and anyone listening that's that's gluten intolerant as well vietnam is a great place to visit because most things are rice based right <laughs> it, uh, yeah rice and handy. rice and a lot of herbs and it's a very easy place to be veggie or vegan so yep. you know i i will eat Refresh. meat but I, yeah i eat veggie a lot of the time here actually and it's in central vietnam or north vietnam it's, it's really easy to do that but again but for meat lovers it's also a, an awesome place and if you're for seafood because right here we're on the coast and so the old town of hoi an you, that you've been to and you're familiar with if you if you ride through that and sh- towards the coast a bit more there's a, a fish market there that, so each morning super early in the morning they bring in the daily catch and you can go down there and 
buy that or you go and find the restaurants that you know are, are serving it and so for seafood lovers it's a heaven fantastic so if we then venture to what you do in the north of the country where so that's into Hoi An or you base yourselves in Hoi An and go up north or how does that work uh, normally people do a tour in either central Vietnam so out of Hoi An or Da Nang and or they do they choose the north and so the north yeah that's what I mean sorry uh, yeah so in the uh, north people fly into Hanoi Hanoi and then yeah. we do Hanoi, Hanoi, in, Hanoi. yeah <laughs> I do that one so uh, yeah it's a confusing Hanoi and Hoi An but <laughs> We, yeah, yeah. we generally we fly them in. But you can ride out of, straight out of the city, but normally we transfer people. So we've got two big areas we go to up there. One is uh, we go up northeast. So that's where the, the Northern Frontier ride that we do, which is more of an event style tour. So it's just a four day ride, which has a competitive element with we have we lay out 17 KOM segments on it. So in between the segments, which are all uphill, you can ride easy and relax with your friends and chat but that when it comes to the segment if you want to you hit it and then it becomes a competition so that is uh we go to the to the northeast we just transfer uh, about an hour and a half out of the city and then we ride from there around 600k with 9,000 meters of elevation over the four days and up up in the in the northeast it's very rugged limestone mountains with more shades of green than you can imagine and a lot of new road actually so this uh, northern frontier ride especially the guys out of who came out of hong kong and singapore who weren't but had I think quite low expectations of the road quality they were going to hit could not believe that the first day it was like pool table quality all day long wow. up there and then in uh, then you get further up right into the the very north which along the border with uh, with China uh, more remote the roads are a little bit less perfect up there but still you can still ride 23 mil tires if you want to up there all day long okay and then uh, you've got huge passes up to around sort of 1,500 meters and some monster sort of 18k 19k climbs up there the other area we go to is uh, the north west which is probably what people imagine when they think of vietnam a bit more so the the rice terrace postcard pictures of these huge rice terraces that's more of the scenery up there and up there you've got anything up to 30k one of the climbs is 30 kilometers so oh, yeah wow. you've got European Alpha. Is that the Sapa area yeah so up to the Sapa area you do that one normally we come in a back way and don't do that monster we do a slightly different climb if people really want to hit something huge and we can take them around to the, the 30k one and, and then people who are interested in Strava quite like that because they're very few despite the fact it's 30 kilometers and amazing I think it's, I don't know I haven't looked at a leaderboard lately but it's maybe 50 people who've done it or not certainly oh, not wow, many so fine. if you want if you're looking for top 10 then uh, it's a pretty good place to, to be. And and then, some, of course, we can link them together. So if people really want a monster, you can go northeast to northwest and put together an absolutely massive tour. But generally, people who want something so huge like that will say, maybe think about the Vietnam Lao. So they get to see two countries and then we take them from... Hanoi, uh, all the way down to Luang Prabang, Vientiane, and Champasak, and then back in and finish uh, with coffee in Hoi An. Right, okay. You're going to have to um, give me some, right, uh, uh, some notes to put in the show notes, for some locations, just to get so people can help get their geography around the place as well. Yeah, we've been putting together a lot more content on the Velo Vietnam CC website. Just, and a lot of these are on there, so I'll send you some some links to, to put up. And that tour, the Velo, the Lao one I'm talking about, is the one that we did first time with customers, was when Emma Pooley came and joined us on it. And uh, yeah. with just one friend of hers and so that's and that looked epic yeah, didn't you do some involved. incredible amount of climbing in a short amount of time what was the climbing stats no, I'll have to, I have to love it I didn't go on that one actually Ashley I used to work on guidebooks in Laos and that's my background with it but actually Ashley's wife is she's Aussie but she's Lao heritage so he has a particular interest right, okay. in discovering Lao more and so he's yeah. the the kind of more the Velo we actually bought VeloLao.cc as well and that's more his his domain but it's something like 2000k and I don't know a lot a lot of meters of gain a lot of climbing because generally in Laos meters. it doesn't it doesn't there's not much flat in the north it's up down up down up down all day long so uh, yeah it's tough going and we try and find uh, more a gravel or well dirt whatever gravel bike friendly roads in Laos so yeah whatever the, the elevation gain says it's you can kind of double it in terms of how it feels it's so, great yeah, so, so in terms of just a pure cycling going. perspective that you've, you've basically got anything on offer from a cycling perspective be it in the center or, or up north with the added element of the fact that it's genuine frontier, not a 30 kilometer climb and 50 people have done it. This is, it's, there's a bit of, I suppose, adventure element to it as well. It's off the beaten track. And has cycling been growing in Vietnam over the, since in the last five years? How's the sport been evolving within the Vietnamese community? Yeah, it's growing massively. I mean, in terms of the, the segment board stuff there, I mean, even out towards the climb we do out near Laos, I know like the first time we did that with some, with a, with a tour group, we had about five women on it. And those five 
five women became the five women on the on the QOM board. So it's that untouched that people are just aren't riding it at all in some places. But in terms of the scene, I'm, when I moved here in Hanoi, there was no bike shop where you could ride, buy a road bike. And now I would guess there's probably 30 or so bike shops where you could buy a, a decent road wow. bike and some with proper good mechanics now. But that uh, gives a good indication of it. In terms of the the scene, it's yeah, it's developed massively. The, a good way to describe it actually is my the team, the Vietnamese team that I ride with, like the local amateur team, is called Taiho Cycling, and they got that name because they used to ride around Taiho Lake, Ho Tay Lake in Hanoi, but just on mountain bikes, you know, really slowly. And then they graduated across to the road, and now they're they're racing they're racing bikes, and they used to race maybe or ride as a team of maybe five or six, and they would ride alone, and then there would be another small team riding alone in a in another part of Hanoi, different times of day. And then uh, a couple of years ago, or maybe maybe a bit more, uh, one person started a club called T2 Cycling Open. And the open in that means, and they say it in English, and the open means open to everybody, anybody can join or anyone can just be there at 5.30, whether they're from that club or any other club and so now you would go on a good day and you might find a hundred riders on that riding a wow. sort of semi semi race of every tuesday and thursday and then on sunday they have a, a proper race well it's completely illegal but <laughs> they ride they ride a race on the open roads every sunday and again that could be around a hundred people and the same goes down in saigon you've got a few lots of different little bunches but they come together in a three or three different parts of the city and uh, yeah, yeah. So it's, a, it's a great scene uh, to be part of and it's super welcoming but completely different I have to, to say I did have it was a few years ago. I I have ridden once down in Saigon with Dale Nottingham, who I think worked with you. And I firstly I was blown away just how many cyclists and local cycling teams and clubs there were. It was staggering given how truly terrifying the traffic <laughs> was, I'll be honest with you. It was uh, one of the scariest rides I've ever done. But to your point, incredibly accommodating group. When we got back into town, we grabbed coffee with everyone and I said to everyone, You guys must really, really love cycling to ride this every weekend. It's uh, it's busy down there right yeah Ho Chi Minh City is a is a different is a different ball game we don't do at fellow Vietnam we don't do any riding in the in the south well, there's beautiful riding in, in Dalat area but yeah Saigon I was gonna just crazy. ask you about Dalat yeah yeah Dalat is fantastic that's another option about Dalat. so we've only done a couple of tours there and the, the reason we did it actually is because the group it was their fourth time I think it was the fourth time they'd come back to us for a for a training okay. camp so we, we wanted to vary it up so we, we took them down to Dalat and actually the, the national team trained there and it's a beautiful place right. and the uh, the climate's a lot more sort of European, a bit cooler, and you're staying up at around 1,500 meters altitude there. And there is a climb actually in from the coast, which is another 30k climb, take you from beautiful beach right up into the into the mountain. So that's somewhere that we we use as a, a third option. People who want something okay. something different. So just help me get my bearings. Where where is Dalat? It's... Dalat's more in the south, so you can okay. get the bus, a night bus up there from Ho Chi Minh City, say, and then Da Nang okay, right. in the middle, and then Hanoi right at the top. So yeah, this. Uh, it, like yeah it's a it's a it's a crazy place to ride down there and i like you actually i went down i go down there not too often but i went down i did the road race that they do one weekday morning and then oh, i was heard with about a, this. well i wouldn't do it again I was with a, it was a german friend of mine who took me and it was complete insanity and after the ride i did question his sanity and did well, yeah, point out he had three <laughs> children and perhaps shouldn't do that every week but the one in hanoi yeah, is I thought, safer yeah okay good good to know yeah i had heard about that infamous race in, in ho chi minh coming um, up to a toll then, gate and i thought they won't race through the toll gate surely we'll stop and just have a little ceasefire while we go through that but no straight through the through, through the toll oh. gate so yeah gives you an idea but the one in Hanoi is no traffic light, 25k, relatively safe, I promise. Sane, yeah, relatively safe. So in terms of the three options, they're, they're, they're sort of the three core options, are they? Sort of up north, be it the, the east or west, the central and, and the latter as well, where, where you do your tours. What, what's the big variant between the three? Obviously, we talked about the, the terrain, the road quality, pretty consistent between all three areas. Does the food change depending on where, where you are in the country? Because that's another thing, people listening, it's quite easy to forget or not appreciate just how big Vietnam is as well yeah the, the topography is very different i mean up north you've got the, the really the grand mountain ranges so the, you've got the highest peak up there is 3,000 meters and you you ride up to 1800 meters here in central vietnam still still big mountains but it isn't at that on that scale and we do mostly kind of 11k climbs there's one climb that's around 17 kilometers here but if, it's, it's generally if people want to go really big and epic then we go north and the other thing is in here in central vietnam you've got the option of coast and mountains so people like if they want to have 
have more of holiday vibes. They want to yeah, be on the yeah, beach yeah. with a beer. And it's great. I love to do that. You know, you finish a tour on the beach with a beer in hand and have a fantastic meal, you know, with your toes in the sand. And then I get a lot of people want to come over to, especially from Europe, and they want to fit, have that that feeling of, of being in sort of tropical paradise mixed in with their with their cycling. Yeah. So, and then in, yeah, like I say, in Dalat, it's about the, it's more comfortable climate if you want that to feel less hot. So people who are coming over from Europe, they can find it very easy to slot in there and temperature wise feel feel good. And yeah, the food is very different everywhere. Everybody in Vietnam is very proud of their the food in Vietnam and everybody's particularly proud of the food where they're from. So if you talk to anybody right. here, they'll, they'll, they'll tell you about their speciality of their, their area. And yeah, here in central Vietnam, it's a lot of, uh, of course, there's a lot of seafood right by the coast here in, in Da Nang. Uh, and that can be cooked just simple grilled seafood or like, the emphasis a lot of the time here is on, on herbs. So you'll have a lot of wraps where you just you stuff a lot of herbs in, in with your in with your seafood and, and enjoy it that way. And all the noodle dishes are very, very, very herb, herby and, and fragrant. Everything will come with a massive basket of herbs on the side. And up north, it's people are particularly proud of the, the pho, which is or pho, if, you know, P-H-O, which is, I think, yeah. pretty big. You can find plenty. Yeah, that in London now, right? And Gan, there, so it's, so hang on, can we just just stop there? What's the actual proper pronunciation then? It's fur, is it? Yeah, it's well, it's fur, but if you want to be, <laughs> if you really want to give it some, it you that you have to bend it so it has the haughty tone on it, so you say fur, but fur ah. would be would be good enough. And uh, yeah, in the north, everyone's proud of that, and it, then rightly so. I mean, I'm biased because I came into Viet to Vietnam and to Hanoi, so I became influenced much more by the northern Vietnamese but I think they're they're right the fur up there is is fantastic and one of the things about Hanoi this isn't great for the veggies but when you're in Hanoi especially at lunchtime you walk around and it's the whole all the streets it's barbecue pork because they have the this dish bun cha which is uh, like pork patty and then uh, bacon essentially and all grilled on the open barbecue and grilled on the street and they use fans to keep the charcoal going which means that the the scent oh, of that is being is coming down the street constantly at you so it around yeah, it's very very good and again a massive basket of herbs comes on the side with that as well so yeah it, it's different everywhere you go but it's it's fantastic everywhere you go and it's honestly like in the in the in the towns it's much more there's much more variety when we get out onto the road and go remote it's more you get your sort of rice and vegetable and and meat dishes and then it, but always fur is available so if people are into that and most people are then yeah they're pretty happy with the with the food that's that on offer well. and coffee's big Good. here too like cafe I'm huge just amount about of to say yeah and, uh, am i the, right in saying that i think co- one of the biggest coffee countries in the world in terms of production export yeah second second biggest exporter i mean mostly it's robust uh, like the quality of a lot of it isn't amazing but the the way they do it here with the ice and the condensed milk is pretty addictive so, and especially if you're on a, on a ride and that's caffeine and the sugar hitting one so but more and more places as well uh you have the more espresso style coffee shops so here in hoi an there's i don't know 10 at least 10 where you can go and get fantastic coffee and the best macchiato in the world is about 100 meters from my house here so uh and that's more of the arabica so increasingly people are growing arabica here and, and offering uh vietnam style iced coffee and then also the espresso style coffee as well but what we do is on the tour if people aren't into the iced coffee style then we just we just take a, an aeropress and a collection of different beans vietnamese beans with us and then get very uh, geeky about making AeroPress coffees along the way. So people are always catered for for their caffeine addictions. Funny how it's synonymous with cycling now, which is great. Um, I know we touched on it earlier, but I'm, I'm really interested to, to learn a little bit more about the Frontier event you're, you're trying to develop. Can, can you tell us a little bit about where that idea came from and, and where you want to take the event over the next few years? Yeah, so the, the Northern Frontier is the one that we ran for the first time last year. And that idea, I'd been th- playing with that for a long time. And the, the idea really came from the fact that it's the place I wanted to tie all my favourite climbs in the in the northeast and the direct north together. And I love I love racing my bike, but I also find racing a little bit stressful. And I wanted to tie in that competitive element with a relaxation element as well. So the idea of this is that that you, as I say earlier, you 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 race the segments if you want to, and but they're all uphill, so you haven't got to worry about someone taking you out. And you're generally strung out anyway because they're uphill. So uh, yeah, you get that competitiveness without without the stress. And so we did it last year and tested it with a group of around uh, 18 people and people loved it and I'm afraid I loved it and that's always a good sign I didn't I just enjoyed the uh, running it and I kind of took part got a little bit involved in some of the segment battles but yeah it's I, I think the concept is something that a lot of people who enjoy the racing but don't like the stress of it will, will appreciate yeah exactly. Um, so, I like it as well so talk us through the itinerary so if someone's flying in talk us through the four days how it works where they stay the, the whole give us the whole 
experience. So for the northern one, people fly into Hanoi and then we all, all stay in one hotel together and have a, a dinner with a little bit of a briefing. And then we wake up early doors the next day, transfer for an hour out of town or an hour and a half until we get to the, the good the good riding. And then we do that first day is 180k and we okay. roll pretty like, right. flat for 30k and then smash into a, one of the first the first KOM segments. And then that day, as I said earlier, the, the, the pavement, the, the tarmac on that is just incredible pretty much from start to finish, super smooth and, and and it was it had just been finished actually when we when we read it last time and then we arrive in the northeast the capital of Kaobang province in the in the northeast the next day we can have a little bit of a later start it's a bit shorter and we do around about i think there's four kom segments that next day and again fantastic road quality on that one and on, in that one we put in one segment which is a bit less less of a steep gradient so people who are a bit on the heavier side can uh, can battle for it and then we we end well, in uh, that day in the town yeah perfect <laughs> um, and actually you can we, we, had, we had a couple of teams on that one so we got into a bit of a we had I think it was three two teams of three in little pace lines sort of taking on each other Brilliant. so you can have little team battles on it as well but also yeah. saying that we had a few people on it who really weren't com- like they're competing with themselves but they're not interested in getting a KOM or they just want to get to the end of this thing it's like a challenge just to finish it yeah. So, um, yeah, yeah. and there's no divide between the people who are trying to be competitive for the top end and those people, I think because of the format of the event, somehow it just worked and everyone fitted together. So, um, yeah, the next day uh, we end in a town, which really is kind of our end of nowhere and a pretty basic, but very clean, but pretty basic hotel. And yeah, it's certainly not a place cyclists would normally find themselves in, but we got a great little restaurant next door and have like a big feast. Um, and each night we give out the, the jerseys for either some, well, of course, some top segments or somebody who's done something particularly nice for other people or, we have a little different reasons for, for doing that. And then uh, third day, we really get into the to the big hills. So that's when we get up to Hazang. And up there, there's a there's a pass called uh, Mata Pi Leng, which is, again, famous in Vietnam, but perhaps not famous outside it at all. But uh, stunning, just a completely mind-blowing climb that you've got. I put segments on that for the competition, but put a break in between them because you've got to stop and uh, take photos. So we got to uh, yeah, schedule in the photo breaks, which is always important on a bike tour. Uh, and then we end up really far up north. But this uh, the, the town up there has become a bit of uh, quite popular with particularly sort of local, like the Vietnamese tourists on m- motorbikes. So you've got a lot more uh, facilities up there and a couple of quite cool little bars. So that night, we in the, even though we're in the middle of nowhere, we go out and have a decent few beers uh, in a in a quite a nice bar uh, and then the last day is another huge day with uh massive climbs and then we finish in a in a little homestay in a little uh, thai i think minority still house outside uh, the town and have a big feast uh, to finish the day and then next time uh, i think we'll opt for the option that you people can either stay there for the night and relax or we're going to put on more kind of limo luxury uh buses with cycling videos to bring them back to to Hanoi because that was the one thing I got to admit last time we used uh, more sort of standard minivans which weren't so good so we've learned that and we'll definitely make it a little bit more uh, of a luxury experience bringing the cyclists back back into the city so yeah it's 17 K- KOMs over the course of those four days and uh, around about 9,000 meters and about 600 k's so that's the northern one and then I'm going to make one here, which I've done the first few recon recce rides for, which I was going to call Central Frontier until uh, someone, again, you might know, Guy from Hong Kong, he came over and did the, the re- one of the recce with me and pointed out that Western Frontier would be a better name. And he's yeah, very right. Yeah, well- so uh, yeah. the central one is Western and uh, next week or in a couple of weeks, I'll be going to test a stage for that, which is going to be potentially 230k, which I'm not sure is too much or uh, so i think it is too much but i'm gonna go and test it anyway so it's 230k on a very remote road the ho chi minh west road which is Mate. hugging the border with Lao, so hence, hence uh, yeah. western frontier and yeah. we'll find out about that one soon so i'll either do uh, a 230k day in that or somehow chop it up and transfer people into it a little way but that one will be another four day monster with I probably put 17 to 20 koms in it and the same format so race the kom segments and enjoy the riding in between those segments and when are you planning what time of year are you planning to hold both these events moving forward so the northern will run in uh october november time and the western will run in late march early april next year but this year we might run a a test event on the western one maybe even september october time but i'll uh, certainly be putting that on and found 
when it's there. Uh, the yeah, right time. definitely. And if people are interested, I mean, what I love about these kind of things is that not only do you have epic cycling, you're also exploring new places. The food's amazing. The culture's amazing. It's like a whole round experience, which is so unique and I think so interesting. If people are interested in getting involved, they can drop you. We'll put all your contact details on the show notes and stuff like that, but they can get in touch either about these events or any other sort of trips that they may want to do. Yeah, absolutely. As I say, normally when people get in touch, the the, the next stage is a, a chat on WhatsApp or, or whatever. And I'm always happy to, to have a more of a personal chat about what people are looking for. Yeah. Yeah. Is there anything else that, that you know, people that might have listened to this and, and sort of pricked their ears and, and interest that you can tell them around cycling in Vietnam, how easy it is and, and the options of, available to them? Is there anything that you feel that people may make some misconceptions or they should know prior to booking a plane or thinking about a trip? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the misconceptions is has been uh, <laughs> nicely reinforced by your Ho Chi Minh City experience, which is that it's a bit insane on the roads here. And, and it is, of course, in the t- <laughs> you're dead, dead right. And I, as I say, I've, I've had that experience too. In the city, particularly that city, it's uh, it's pretty, pretty intense. But when you're out on the roads here, it's really really cyclist friendly people always comment you hear the the toot toot of the horn quite often here but it's it's but just to let you know that they're coming so when you're out in the mountains you'll hear the toot toot and uh, and after very quickly you get used to it and actually you appreciate it and often they're toot tooting to say hello and like a thumbs up so people are generally really happy to see cyclists on the road and very welcoming and the other thing is i think because everybody's come off if they've got a car there's they're going to have ridden a motorbike before everybody in vietnam's had a motorbike and most people have bike have been cyclists as well so there are people are much more aware of the the being on a two-wheel vehicle rather than in a in a car so yeah i always feel i I was just going to say actually I i think for anyone that's listening that's that's hasn't cycled in asia before i think that when you go to countries obviously ho chi minh central central aside when once you get out i think most drivers are more aware of cyclists than anywhere in the world i've ever ridden because they're so used to mopeds and motorbikes being yeah. everywhere they're, they're used to looking out for them so i actually bizarrely or if it, it seems a little bit more hectic it actually feels safer in a lot of ways absolutely yeah when i go back to the england and ride around Norfolk or, or Cambridge here where my family and my wife's family are. It terrifies me how close people come and pass yeah, and, exactly, and don't yeah. beep to let me know they're coming, <laughs> which is something I've just yeah. got so used to that they would, they would, they would do that. It's just they're, all, they're upon you and, and very close. So, yeah, it's for sure it feels, it feels a, lot, a lot safer. And, but the fact is mostly out in the more remote places that we go, you just don't see people. Uh, you don't see cars. And if, if you do see vehicles, they're normally, uh, normally motorbikes. So, yeah, that's, yeah. that's a big, big part of it. And also, yeah, just the ease of access really like i say you can fly into both these airports and be out on the bike that same day and into beautiful mountain scenery very 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 quickly so uh yeah and if i'd say as well if people are i don't suppose unfound has too many listeners who don't like hills but if people are the kind of cyclists that are into more sort of easy tourist friendly riding we don't do the tours down there much but the mekong delta is dead flat if you want a very very easy oh, right. ride you know, maybe with family or kids, you can always go down there and, and, and get you something can else. Do that. But yeah, you can. We just don't. <laughs> but it's, the, it's there it. for sure. Yeah. I think we cover most of them off. But in terms of if you were if I was to press you now and say your, your absolute favorite climb in Vietnam, what what would what would it be? Although it sounds like you're still discovering new roads and new climbs every month. But what's your favorite one? Yeah, that is very hard. I think I'd have to say I have to split it into different parts of the country. So my favourite climb is also my least favourite climb, and that's called in English we call Monkey Mountain, and in, uh, in Vietnamese they call uh, Hi Zao, which is Old Monkey, which is on that peninsula right by the airport in Da Nang. So you could be off the plane and on that, so it's probably three kilometres away from that from the airport, which is uh, 5.6 k at 10 percent, and it just is 10 percent all the time. So there's no lab on it. And uh, once you're at the top there, it's, yeah, it's pretty horrific. Yeah, but the view at the top is just fantastic, and it's also the place where you can see this endangered red chank Dirk Langer if you're very lucky. So there for the for the central Vietnam, and for the north, probably Ba Vi Mountain because it's the first mountain that I really fell in love with in Vietnam, and it's I, I did a Everesting on that mountain, so it has a kind of special place in my heart. So that's a around about 11.5 k at eight percent. Yeah, and through it's a national park. Hang on, I so if you go early, there's I no roads. About that. There's no roads, there's no cars. Yeah, you, there's no cars on there, nice and quiet. So you are a serial Everester, aren't you? How many have you done? Uh, three Everestings, and so two in Vietnam and one back in England. Okay, okay. where was the other um, one in Vietnam yeah. you've done? So there's uh, the climb, the local climb outside Hanoi is a 2.5k, 10%, but that is a complete 
lie of a gradient. So there's, there's a few flats in there. So there actually is a lot of pitches at 20% or so, but which sounds bad, but it's not as bad as Rhino's Pass, which a lot of the UK listeners all know right. in England, which is a bit of a beast. But I did that on the most what? amazing day in, in summer a couple of years ago. So uh, I got lucky with the weather in one way and it was a fantastic light, but also a, a headwind. Brutal which climb. It yeah, it's yeah, a, yeah, it's a monster, but The only thing is not as bad as the Hard Knot Pass just next to it, which is uh, which would be ridiculous. And somebody has Everest did that and I would question their, their sanity for sure. Sanity. Yeah, really amazing yeah, yeah. cycling for... Uh, for people who don't know uh, the UK, I don't know which cycling tour company is running good tours up in uh, in the Lake District. But for sure, if I wasn't from that part of the world, I'd be very, very keen to take a holiday there because the, r- the riding up there is just uh, incredible. Yeah, spectacular part of the world. Of the three Everesting attempts, which was the, the hardest? Rhinos, absolutely. And that's, I don't think any, I'll never do anything. I'd never take on a, a climb like that before, again for an Everesting. It's ridiculous. Yeah, but they... There's pictures on that 25% for way too long. So I don't, people who aren't familiar with English roads, the country lanes here have little things we call passing places, which are so one car can squeeze in and another car can, can squeeze past them. And they have a few of those on Rhino's Pass, which they're at on the points that are about 25%. And the, the passing place is no less steep than the other place. But psychologically, I was just having to convince myself just to make it to that next little passing spot and then stop in it and then try and get clipped in to go again was bloody hard. So that was, uh, yeah, psychologically and physically the hardest the hardest of all of them for sure and the other one the bar v1 at 11k 8 percent is much more of a that's about right i think if you can if you're looking for an everesting you can find something around eight percent and somewhere around that nine 10k mark is uh, perfect i think you think that's a sweet spot interesting yeah interesting would you do another one uh me and ash have talked about doing high Vun on a tandem so that might happen but i don't know if either of us can spend that much time in each other's company but we'll see and he's also pointed out it's quite hard to quite hard to climb on a tandem but actually he's done yeah. tandem tours two times with the vision impaired all the way from Sapa to uh to hanoi so that's another thing actually that's uh that's available here so yeah tandem tandem tours is a thing but so yeah maybe we'll do that one and then monkey mountain i was talking about earlier is maybe i'll do that with a an ultra runner that i'm friends with here who's who loves that mountain too we've talked about him running it and me me riding it one day so yeah it might maybe he would run an everest yeah he did he this time he will sensibly use the in the rules of the everest thing you can take a motorbike down so you don't have to run the oh, descent blood. but he did do uh he did do one on trail which he took something like 36 hours and the trail looked it wasn't it was the vague the most loosest sense of a trail like rocky technical and so of course he couldn't take a motorbike down that so he did up and down so yeah whenever i'm thinking and everything's hard. How yeah, long did that take him? Crazy. Yeah, th- I think it was 34, 35, 36 hours, something like that. He's uh, I pretty love it. That's pretty cool, yeah. I feel that I've rabbited on a lot, but in, in terms of, I just wanted to go quickly because I know that you've, you've done quite a lot on the trail running side in Vietnam as well. And you've done a lot also, so quite a bit of sort of charity and community work in, over there as well. Can you quickly tell us a little bit about that if you've got time? Yeah, so first up, the for the charity work, I do a lot of work with Newborns Vietnam. So Newborns Vietnam, a few years ago, all their money came from cycling events, uh, just actually sort of epic challenges, Sapa to Da Nang, for example, and then more recently, um, business rides, Asian, we call Asian business rides, bringing people in for a three-dayer. And uh, so I get involved on those as ride a ride leader or a ride captain, together with a few other cyclists and and we run them voluntarily. And so that's Newborns Vietnam. And then I started a, a climb event, which is called the Isla Climbing Challenge, which is outside Hanoi on that Zom climb. So it's concept there is you're at two hours and you climb it as many times as you like. So that brings together people from their cycling clubs in Hanoi. And some people will ride it one time. And that because it's such a beast, like that's been done. And other people ride two, three, four, five climbs. And the idea is they just put the money in the pot themselves. So, and people are very generous. So some people have thrown in like 500 bucks or a thousand bucks from their own pocket. And rather than try and get sponsorship, which of course is quite hard with a lot of donor fatigue now, it's just throwing money yourself. So that's, yeah, something that I, I'm involved with on a personal level, very passionate about that charity. And uh, yeah. yeah, that ties in actually with the, the trail runs here we have. Uh, like I say, when I first came, there weren't any. And uh, we started one in 2013. We had around 200 people on the start line and I think two or three Vietnamese people. And this year we've had, well, last year we had around 8,000 runners over three events and wow. up to 90% Vietnamese participation. So it's completely, absolutely shifted 100% uh, the, the trail running scene here in Vietnam over those over those. Yeah. Well, it's incredible that that endurance i suppose the endurance community both cycling and running has just in the 10 years you've been out there has just exploded hasn't it particularly running and yeah cycling is has grown but the trail running is just 
like I say, it's, it's five people to probably 7,000 people running up to 100K in the mountains. So yeah, it's, it's, it's huge. And Ironman as well, actually, they, they started with, in a country, a lot of people don't swim. And you had people here who, you know, they don't do, I uh, won't do a sprint or an Olympic distance first. It's I'll just sign up for an Ironman and get a swimming teacher at the same time and then hope to not get cut off in the swim and complete my first 70.3. And a lot of people do it. So it, it's just a, it's a really fun place to be in terms of people just being not only passionate, but it's something new. So there's a very special special feeling here at the moment in that in the sport community so yeah yeah that's brilliant it's quite a quick 70.3 course isn't it yeah it's super fast it really it's dead flat but also the road is very very quick between so they from danang along the coast super fast there's just one bridge to go over and uh, the problem for the i I don't do the whole thing i just as a cyclist do the do the relay and i'm always very happy to get off the bike and go and get my free beer because uh, the runners have to then go out on uh, like stupidly hot normally so i've got a lot of respect for the people who managed to to knock out the whole all three the disciplines on that one yeah a lot of people come back again and again for it so even though it's, it's yeah it's super hot but it's like it's, yeah a lot of people pb on it on the course and actually we had a girl come over from china katrine she won that whole thing her age group and then the next day came on a velo wow. vietnam tour went out and took all the qoms did a 130k ride the next day so oh, yeah it works great. well yeah. as a recovery after <laughs> some sort of recovery after it if people want to do that well so it means people can plug on some some riding with you guys after after da nang 70.3 and do you do any kind of have you had done any tours where people who have come over and done some trail running and also some cycling and mix it all up as well yeah so like for emma pooley is a good example of that because she's really she describes herself as a as a sort of a frustrated runner she's she was a runner first and then obviously becomes a champion cyclist but she she would go out and knock out sort of 21 k's before a 150 k ride and so it, particularly in one of the races i started is in a nature reserve just outside hanoi in uh, Puluang. it's called vietnam jungle marathon and so yeah. we run a lot of our gravel tours go out through that way so if people want to then uh we can put together a, a trail run on the on the trails that we use for that vietnam jungle marathon and also actually what we started to do is ride people on some of the sections as well not all of it's rideable but we can reroute it around so people can ride that or run it if they're if they're into that and i'm i always love it if people like a uh, trail running as well because we can we can mix the two together so yeah it has crossed my mind to try and actually mash them together in a in a trail run and gravel tour but i think the market for that's probably a little bit small <laughs> but if people if anyone's listening and wants to do that kind of thing then uh, yeah it'd be great yeah. well that's it i mean i think there's the, we've barely sort of touched the surface or great past the surface today i mean this sounds like there's so many different options different places to go cycling for all abilities i think it's best if if anyone's interested in learning a little bit more to drop david an email and he can get the ball rolling in terms of what could potentially be suitable for your touring party or your small group or whatever but amazing place to go cycle by the sounds of things yeah you need to come over jules <laughs> not to hope you <laughs> I know. Well, I have been a couple of times, but sadly, sadly we haven't connected. But yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm desperate. I mean, I'd, I've really enjoyed getting back on the UK roads. It's after a decade away, you forget how good some of the cycling is in the UK. But I, I do miss Asia, and I think I miss it for that exact reason. A, a, the cycling is fantastic, but it's it's everything off the bike as well. It's the whole experience. I think that's you know you go away and you have a, a holiday and a cycling trip, and you learn something, and you see different cultures, and you try new food and you see different things so that's i love that whole that whole package of it which is um yeah why well, hopefully i'll be back out in asia b- before too long i might even get myself out for one of these frontier events as well that would be awesome well, if not, anything- i'll certainly see you on the roads of london next time i'm back oh definitely we'd love to have you we'd love to have you out here have we covered everything uh, i know we've only sort of touched the surface but as a sort of quick quick introduction to, to vietnam i think we've covered most things yeah i think that's about it I've got one one more question, actually, that I think I forgot to ask you earlier on. We talked about some of your favourite climbs, but we touched on accommodation. But where are your favourite places to stay? What's your favourite accommodation in Vietnam? Uh, again, it's it's hard to choose one, and uh, so I think I'll cheat and pick two. So, one the higher end of the accommodation definitely Topaz Eco Lodge, which is up in uh, the Sapa region, but around 25k out of town. This is an amazing lodge on a, on a hilltop, which uh, has a, an infinity pool looking out over the mountains. Oh. So you, I've seen the photo the of that. Yeah, yeah that I think I sent it to you before. Yeah, it's, so it's the best yeah. place for me to finish a mountain day. So you've got a big climb up to that. And then generally we'll try and finish a ride there at sunset, or in, at least in time oh, wow. for sunset. So we can have a beer by the pool or in the pool looking out over the mountains. So that's at the kind of more luxury end of the accommodation. And then 
for the more sort of minority, ethnic minority, traditional stilt house, I definitely would choose somewhere in uh, the Pulung Nature Reserve I was talking about because it's where we run uh, the Jungle Marathon. So I know a lot of the families that, that live there oh, very right. well. So if you stay with one of those yeah. families and it's a really sort of authentic experience to use a cliche, but yeah, stay with the family and have a proper home cooked meal and, and stay in the stilt house in a much more basic, but I think an experience, like you talk about the experiences that you have in Asia, I think that live staying there is one that was sort of stay with yeah. people for a long time. So, so those two would uh, be my picks. No, that's fantastic. And I think that sums up the whole conversation and experience really with regards to the lodge with the infinity pool, would you mind sharing um, a link that I can put in the show notes? Because that photo that I've seen um, is just quite spectacular. I don't think we can kind of do it justice. It's absolutely wonderful view over the, over the paddy fields, isn't it? Right. Yeah. I'll send it through. And then uh, the, it's my wife in the pool in that photo. So oh, there you go. There you go. That's obviously a big, big factor there in why it's such a, why it's such a shot. Yeah. I'll send that through. Thank you very much for the, for the chat. Good man. Yeah, definitely, mate. Really appreciate you taking the time and we'll make sure that everyone drops you a line if they're uh, interested in getting out to Vietnam in the near future, as I hope I can as well. Thank you very much. Cheers, mate. Cheers, David. Thanks Cheers. a lot. Good to speak to you. Thank you. Cheers, mate. Welcome to the show. Today, I'm joined by Rob McManon. Rob is the founder of Bike Tour Japan. He's been running tours all over Japan for a number of years now. We have a chat about how he ended up in Japan and what makes Japan such a spectacular place to go ride your bike. Before we kick on, if you haven't yet, please do give us a rating for the podcast, leave a review, tell your friends, spread the word. We'd really appreciate any help you can give us with that. And of course, as ever, download the Unfound app and join the global cycling community today. Enjoy the conversation. 